Yeah, Patrick, you can go ahead. Brilliant. Yeah. So I'm Patrick. I'm one of the uh, deanery trainees at Doncaster. This is the first time I think that I've been in Journal Club. Um, so I've sort of just had a good old read and scrutinise. I've used the checklist, but I've not done it as a PowerPoint as the other presentations did. So we're just going to talk through all the sections. Uh, like I say, thanks for having us. And unfortunately, there wasn't another deanery trainee free to give me a hand on this one. So I'll be flying solo for now. The paper that we had to look and scrutinise is the one that hopefully you can all see on your screen here, which is looking at helmet CPAP versus high flow nasal cannula oxygen in the situation of acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and it's an RCT. Um, it was published in the European Society of Cardiology, um, which I presume is a uh, reputable journal, and it was published in August, uh, no, October 2021, sorry. Um, so I'd like to just have a quick peek at the graphical abstract because this is the thing I quite liked about this paper um, and it shows that it's got pictures of the helmet CPAP and high flow nasal just in case anyone has not been um, used uh, or used to them um, and it says it gives you a little graphical representation of their outcomes and uh, what values that they've attained through this. But if we uh, dig down and we work through the CASP checklist, we'll come through to question one, which is, does it address a clearly focused research question? What I like about this paper is that they have put, in, put it in uh, fairly standard format. So they've nearly written it out as a PICO um, question that's been asked. First, the definition of the population. They've gone really into real depth of how they've defined patients who have acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And um, they've talked about it was a diagnosis following clinical examination. And then they've used dual radiological examination. So that's changes on chest X-ray and on ultrasound of lungs, which would in keep, uh, be in keeping with cardiogenic pulmonary edema or certainly pulmonary edema um, as to exclude other causes that they didn't want to include in their sample sizes. They've got strict um, inclusion criteria, which is the patients were obviously adults um, and they were these patients who are on the limits of uh, standard treatment with oxygen, as in they had raised rests, uh, low oxygen saturations, less than 90 percent on 15 litres or as sometimes we term the 30, 60, 90 criteria. And then they had a good set of exclusion criteria as well, um, which is um, contraindications to things of CPAC, such as altered GCS. Um, instability from a hemodynamical source, if they had primary lung disease, obviously they weren't suitable, or if they needed to have further treatment such as intubation otherwise. Um, so I think they've very, done very well in defining what their population is that they will be studying. If we look at the I, so the interventions that were given, now there's actually two interventions that were given in this study. Um, so they obviously randomised and split the patients up to receive either treatment with the um, hooded CPAP or the high flow nasal cannula. And both of these deliver um, high flow of oxygen, but it's just two different methods uh, of delivering it. And they were looking to see which of these interventions had the best outcomes. Um, in terms of the outcomes they were looking at, they were looking at No, oh, no, sorry, that's the O, isn't it? Yeah, so, so that's the two interventions they were looking through. The comparison that they would compare them to would be the standard treatment that they'd already been receiving, which is just oxygen therapy via a non rebreathed face mask. And it goes on to say that, obviously, ethically, given that both of these treatments have been shown to be superior to um, standard oxygen therapy, it wouldn't be ethically appropriate to have a control wing where they did not give the patients high flow oxygen or they did not give the patient CPAP because that would lead to obviously much higher mortality in this group. So the comparison that they would do is comparing it to the oxygen therapy on maximal 15 litres non really breathe mask and they actually compare the patients at the baseline of the entry. So what their, their um, scores were on the 15 litres and then they compared one hour after treatment, what sort of improvements have they been looking through for? And the outcomes that they were measuring, there were several outcomes. 
Um, dun, yes. So they chose as their primary outcome, probably better if I show it on the graphical one here, was the absolute difference um, in respiratory rate. So this is the reduction of respiratory rate from T0 before the patient started treatment to T1, which is one hour after treatment with either the CPAP or the high flow nasal cannula. And the absolute difference, T1, T0, um, they've not given a positive or negative side on this, but I think looking at the data later, we can interpret that this is a reduction in respirate rather than an increase in respirate. I do think they could have made that a bit clear um, as it was a negative difference rather than a positive difference. Um, so reduction in respirate was their primary outcome. They also looked at several secondary outcomes as well, which is the absolute difference in MAP, um, as in mean arterial pressure, heart rate. They looked at PF ratios, which if no one's comfortable using PF ratios, it is the arterial oxygenation compared to the um, fraction of inspired oxygen. So essentially a higher PF ratio shows that you're um, having greater diffusion of oxygen across the lung borders, the um, lung blood barriers. We also looked at these things that we call a HACOR score, which is a five point clinical score, which looks at failure of CPAP therapy. So it's to do with um, heart rate, acidosis, CO2 values, I can't remember the other two, but essentially a higher HACOR score indicates that you're failing on CPAP and that's an indication for intubation. And then they also scored the patients on a dyspnea scale, um, which was a, a point scale where the patients were 10 from I'm as breathless as I can possibly be to zero, as in I'm not breathless at all. And obviously a reduction in the dyspnea scale would say that the patient is having um, less symptoms of shortness of breath. And um, I think that covered all. They also looked at PAO2 and they looked obviously which patients failed treatment and which patients went on to have intubation. So I think they fairly well defined the population, the interventions that they're given and um, what they're comparing it to. And they've picked a good amount of outcome measures um, that they will be looking at in these sets of patients. What I don't think they clearly defined is why they chose respirate as their primary outcome measure. Um, so they said the ideal outcome is that we've reduced respirate at one hour after treatment, um, and this will be our most important. And I would consider whether these um, this is a case of they've shot the arrow and they've drawn the target around um, since their primary outcome was their best uh, outcome that they had. Um, but very much easily, you could have said what we're looking to is we're increasing oxygenation, we want better PF ratios, and we want to reduce the risk of failure. So we could look at high cost score as well. But in this circumstance, they've, uh, they've said that the primary outcome is respirate for unclear reasons. That's a really good point, Patrick. They did register their trial protocol. So you have to hope, I haven't checked it, you have to no. hope they had identified respirate as their primary outcome right up front and didn't just have a look and see what was the shiniest outcome, but point to raise. So that covers our PICO. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the randomization of participants. Obviously, given the obvious visibility of the treatments, as in you're going to know if you're in a CPAP hood or not, um, they weren't able to do randomization of the participants. Um, uh, can I just stop you there? They didn't blind them, but they did randomize them. Oh, sorry. Between the two. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we're talking about randomization, not blinding it, aren't we? So the randomization method, thanks for pointing me out. Uh, so they used a one-to-one -one ratio um, of variable block randomization, um, and that was handed out to a patient on acceptance into the trial. So essentially this is, they put either CPAP or high flow nasal into sealed envelopes, shuffled them all up, and made sure there was an equal amount of CPAP and high flow nasal in those envelopes. And then when a patient came to be on, Presumably the doctor would go and pick the top envelope from the top of the pile and say, okay, this patient is now in the high flow or in the CPAP. Yeah, that is a, so I keep interrupting you and I'm sorry for it, but the, do you know why they've included opaque envelopes? It seems a, a, a small detail to be so precise about. Presumably so you can't peek. Yes. Yeah. It means they don't trust the doctors not to hold them up to the light. And I presume the doctors would pick these rather than, you know, handing them up to the patient saying, 
pick a card, any card sort of deal. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a one way of not subverting the randomization process so that they couldn't tell what they were handing out. Sorry, I'll stop interrupting. Um, so that seems like a fairly um, fairly standard way of doing these randomizations, and it seems to be the the easiest way rather than having to go through computer generated things when these are patients who are you know deteriorating peri arrest patients you don't want to have to try and um, add further steps to this at this point so no it wasn't con the allocation sequence wasn't concealed as in they both knew how the allocation was happening and were fully aware of it as well not entirely i couldn't help myself so mm -hmm. Did say that the person responsible for randomization wasn't part of the clinical team. Okay. Allegation sequence, as in the randomized sequence of numbers, was protected. That was blinded in as much mm -hmm. as nobody knew that apart from the initial person. But the allocation sequence, once it was revealed, once, once the envelopes were opened, then the allocation sequence was uh, obvious to all. Yeah. But they made attempts to conceal it to begin with. Okay. Um, fine. So that was a method of randomizations. Um, was it sufficient to eliminate systematic bias in randomization? So to do that, we would check the characteristics of the study population and we will broadly look at the group that was in the uh, CPAP versus the group that was on high flow nasal. And you can see that um, grossly in terms of gender, ethnicity, BMI, that seemed to have a good level of randomization. There wasn't any great discrepancies. Um, they've used a p-value to calculate this um, just to see if this is something that would happen randomly by chance. Um, and again, the p-values all seem fairly high, which made me think that this is a fairly random event. Um, just having a look at comorbidities, uh, the only thing I'd have a slight issue is that the diabetes mellitus was much more prevalent in <laughs> CPAP um, versus the group with high flow nasal cannula, um, which admittedly there's still a 7% chance of that happened purely by randomness, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't affect the outcome of the investigations. Um, they may also want to consider adding more, com more comorbidities in, such as primary lung pathology being present or history of COPD. Um, the causes um, were all uh, pretty much equal as well across the two groups in terms of why they had ACPO. And then I think the worrying part about this is if we look at the randomization of the patients who, well, this was a post randomization event, it seems that the group in CPAP did have a lot more giving of standard medical treatments such as nitrates and furosemide um, after the randomization has happened. I think I'll talk about that a little bit more in a further point of view. Um, moving to point three, were all of the participants who entered the study accounted for at its conclusion? And just say the patients who ended up, who passed through exclusion criteria, there was about 206 patients that were then randomised at that point. Drop out from the, ah, oh, here we go, here's the chart, isn't it? So yeah, 897 were eligible, but many were excluded as they didn't meet the criteria. Um, as in they didn't have cardiogenic edema, and also a great deal of them met the exclusion criteria, such as they were had reduced GCS, unstable, and these patients who were intubated earlier and not, not taken through into the study. So 219 were eligible, of which 13 refused content, consent. This meant that 206 were randomised, and they were, as you'd expect, with a one-to-one -one ratio of randomization. They were roughly one-to-one, -one. obviously it's never going to be spot on, uh, with about 101 in the helmet CPAP and um, 105 in high flow nasal. Um, some of these were then excluded due to a need for intubation post randomization, which nicely dropped both numbers down to 94 in each group uh, who went on to complete one hour through the treatment. Um, and if we go back to the characteristics, sorry, we're we scrolling up and down. Um, da, 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 da. It gives you the indications of why these patients were intubated, as in they uh, didn't tolerate the procedure, they had worsening failure, or they reduced in consciousness. 
they had predefined in this section here, they had predefined criteria for those patients that were going to drop out, um, which is which is a, a good uh, pre-thought to have had. They said that, you know, if these patients were to deteriorate in this way, it's obviously no longer suitable or ethical to keep them on the, on the trial for the full hour, and they were the ones that would drop out. They looked and they had... Da, 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 da. They had calculated somewhere here. Yeah, seven patients were intubated in the CPAP group and 11 patients were intubated in the high flow nasal cannula group. So although there was a slightly higher dropout in the high flow nasal cannula group um, due to the predefined criteria, there was a high chance, as in there was a 32% chance that this was just a statistical anom anomaly. Um, so it doesn't seem to be something that they can be taken into account when we're looking at final standings. And that accounts for all of the um, patients who were removed from the study during the study. Um, was it stopped early? No, the study was not stopped early. All the other patients completed one hour of, um, of the treatment and then had all their values calculated. And that was used in to take the final uh, results of the study. So that is about all the participants were accounted for. Now we get onto the bit about blinding, um, which I'd Put in a bit earlier just to say that no these patients the participants weren't blinded and um, because they could obviously see what sort of treatments and therapy they were using and the um, physicians involved there was no comment on whether the people analyzing or assessing the data had been blinded as well um, I had a good scour through here so mm -hmm. i don't know if they were blinded from which outcomes which received uh, which is unfortunate. That could have been something that was mentioned if it had been done, which makes you think that it wasn't done if it wasn't mentioned. So on to point number five, were the study groups similar at the start of the randomised uh, randomized trial? Um, again, I think I covered this when we were talking about randomization. There was broad similarity in most parts, although at the start of the trial, there was this one discrepancy about whether for chance reasons, more people with diabetes mellitus had ended up in the CPAP route. Um, so we'd already touched a bit on number five. And then number six, apart from the experimental intervention, did each study receive the same level of care, as in were they treated easily? Um, so again, I would very much query that, um, that the what, for whatever reason that may be, the patients who were in helmet CPAP did seem to receive a greater amount of medical treatment. You can say that it's about a 10%, 11% discrepancy in people were treated more on the CPAP arm than the high nasal cannula. Again, we've got p-values of greater than 0 0.5, which means that there was a 13 and 23% chance that this happened randomly. But even if it did happen randomly, that doesn't tell you if it had a great effect on the outcome of the trial and their interpretation through the results. So that major limiting factor in this study, especially when we get to the results and they say that CPAP patients did a little bit better overall. Um, so I do believe that on question six is an issue that um, they didn't receive the same level of care um, in each group which is a, sort of one of the major flaws of thought of this, of this study. So moving through onto section C, um, were the effects of the results uh, reported comprehensively? So if we move through to the results table, and I'll just rotate this as well, so we're not all straining our necks. And I'll move that box over there. So this is our results table for the primary and secondary outcomes. It's a bit of a um, lot to take in on first glance, um, as it's all very numerical and there's nothing graphical that's being presented on here. So if we just take our time and look down the left side column, so that's our parameters and our outcomes that we were looking for. They put respiratory rate up at the top and then all the other things that were measured. So MAP, heart rate, blood pH, O2, CO2, PF ratio, HACOR and dyspnea scale as well. Then the first four, columns relate to the um, CPAP arm. Um, so you're looking at the respiratory rate. We just talked on that one. You've got 35, which was the mean respiratory rate at zero hours, so pre-treatment. And that had a 95% uh, confidence interval of 34 to 36. Um, so 
they, they were confident that the mean value, 95% confident the mean value was between 34 and 36. And then we look at the respiratory rate at one hour. So this is one hour post commencement of treatment. And we can see that, that has reduced uh, to a mean of 23. And again, they're fairly confident in the value of 23, um, given the range of 23 to 24. And then they've used that to calculate the absolute difference. Um, so they believe that there's a reduction. Again, I would probably express this as a negative 12. Um, uh, reduction of 12 in the mean respiratory rate from the um, from the CPAP arm. Um, and then we've got a p-value, which is the um, the probability that this has happened by um, direct intervention rather than chance, and that's come back at uh, less than point no, less than 0.05, which is a significant um, p-value as well. They've had lots of p-values calculated and uh, they've numbered these with a little c, which means it was calculated by a paired t-test. That process is then repeated for all the variables that continue down. And then in the next four columns under the heading HFNC is the same that's been done for the group that were under high flow nasal cannula. So again, they started with a mean respiratory rate of 33 um, and then a one hour respiratory rate with a mean of 25 and an absolute difference rate of nine in terms of reduction. And that's got a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So again, we can be fairly confident that that is a definite um, input from the high flow nasal and it's not just statistical uh, random chance. Then we get to this final column, and I'm not really quite sure what to make of the final column because this seems to be what the entire results of the study are going to be based on. And this is the comparison between the high flow nasal cannula and the CPAP. And what they've quoted here is the absolute difference in the p-value. Um, now I was I've been struggling to figure out what they mean by absolute distance. We've checked up in the um, part where they've documented their statistical analyses and it doesn't particularly cover in a great deal um, apart from that it was performed using a you know, some sort of corporation who used a protocol through on it and I've been trying to figure out what a absolute difference in p-value is it's not just one minus the other um, but this seems to be what they're using to justify that the CPAP is an improvement on the high flow nasal cannula. Um, I don't I think know. it's as complicated. Yeah, it's not as complicated as it may first appear. The mm. factor is that they've peppered the thing with p-values. You've got p-value for everything. Yeah. If they're a little bit more judicious with the use of their p-values, you would only normally find an end column with p-value. And it, it, I don't believe it's saying it's the absolute... <coughs> difference between p-values this is just a p-value between the two arms of the trial that that is pretty normal so between the absolute differences yeah it, it, are they able to say with certainty that the difference they have found between the CPAP and the high flow nasal cannula is a real difference and that's mm -hmm. that tells you whether or not that's true okay. is the right p-value to rest their case on the fact that they've given you a thousand other ones is the has clouded the issue for you. It isn't, they're not trying to express a difference between p-values there. They're basically just giving you the trial results in that column, which is pretty normal. Right, okay. Um, but where I got to difficulties on this is if we go down to the last, um, the last row, which is the dyspnea scale, mm. and we can see PAP started with a mean dyspnea of two and a... Um, one hour dyspnea, uh, no, sorry, mean dyspnea of six at the start, and that reduced to two, which is an absolute difference of four, with an interquartile range of one to seven. And if we look at the high flow nasal cannula, they started with a mean of five and they reduced to two as well, with an absolute difference of 3.5, but an interquartile range of one to six. Um, I don't see how they could be so confident, as in, have a p value of 0 0.003. Um, given that there's such a huge overlap in the um, potential absolute differences between the two arms? It depends on, let's see, 
I'm not sure I can explain this in, with absolute clarity, mm. but the value at the end is indicating were the results themselves due to chance or due to the interventions and a p-value that's small you could interpret it to say they're sure that the differences were due to the interventions and not chance and that's all you necessarily need to take from that p-value and so we just accept exception that this p-value is sort of sort yeah. of got because the way I would look at it is I would look at, okay, there's been a reduction of 12 in respiratory rate in absolute difference. And we, we're 95% confident that that is somewhere between 11 and 13. Um, and in absolute difference, we're 95% confident that that is somewhere between eight and 10 when all of the statistics are taken into value. So I'd say, oh, look, there's no overlap between those confidence intervals. I'd be fairly confident in saying that the CPAP performed better in that circumstance than the high mm -hmm. But when we get down to the bottom ones, especially where you've got you've got a confidence is somewhere between zero and twelve, and this one's somewhere between two and nine. Um, how can they then interpret that as saying that because they do in their conclusions saying that it's been demonstrated at reducing the HACOR score much better in CPAP than high flow nasal? And well, all this. Right. different absolute values i mean it's not mega but it is different that the p value itself is just to to say was that due to the intervention or was that random the calculations on the p value i think it's going beyond critical appraisal to try and recalculate their p values i'll be honest i, I love your attention to detail but i think we have to accept that the p values that said they produced are the ones that they did produce yeah, it would be nice to have a bit more in-depth in terms of what they've done statistically to generate these p-values, whereas I think the statistical um, backup of that is, is fairly brief and vague. And again, I would also like it to be, to be demonstrated graphically, but that's just because I look at a whole wall of numbers and I find it yeah. very difficult to pick out what their key points from this are. Yeah, no, I agree with you. If we look at the p-values, they take it as um, we have significant findings in most of these, as in reductions in respirate, uh, mean arterial pressure, oxygenation, PF ratio, hay cost score, and dyspnea scale as well. Um, through some of these other bullet points, how it's measured, how they expressed, we covered that. Uh, there was only one follow-up interval. The data is complete. The differential dropout. Statistics have used. Um, yeah, they've used a whole bunch of statistical tests, which I didn't look into. There's been four different ways of generating the p-values, but I'm just assuming that's the type of data that they've got, whether it's normal or or a skewed distribution, whether it's a continuous or it's a discrete data, is why they've applied different values to different p-values. Um, Result uh, section eight, were confidence intervals reported? Yes, they've all been given in confidence intervals. I think apart from this one, which is given in IQRs, um, which is interquartile ranges as well. So number nine, did the benefits of the experimental intervention outweigh the harm and costs? Um, and again, as they previously stated, let me just rotate this back, that both of these studies before had been proven to um, be better than the comparison, which is as, as not to treat them with high flow oxygen. We're looking at the, is there a justification of using CPAP over high flow nasal cannula? Because if we go down to their conclusion, um, they've said that CPAP appears in the very short term to be more effective than high flow nasal at improving dyspnea, hemodynamics, and the respiratory parameters of the patient. Um, coming back to the results, they, we can say that they both had a great amount of reduction, as in the respirators have been improved massively in both of them. We can see they both had a massive improvement of a PF ratio as well, improvement in dyspnea, HACOR score at the one hour mark as well. So, I mean, they could both be very much justified in using of treatments. Can the, um, can we justify using CPAP outright over high flow nasal cannula? Um, they've said that there is a significant improvement, which would seem to back that up. Um, there was a 
no statistical uh, statistically um, significant difference in the dropout rates in patients that needed to be intubated during the study. There's no mention of a cost, cost effect analysis between these, but in both circumstances, the thing that they're changing is just the end delivery mechanism of the CPAP hub versus the high flow nasal cannula. Both of them will run on vastly the same infrastructure, the same plumbing through the walls, the same machines to deliver high concentrated oxygen as well. Um, so I wouldn't assume that there'll be a great amount of difference between the plastic hood and the plastic nose pieces. Um, So they could, there could be an argument that they would um, be worth the extra harms and costs because one, there wasn't extra, any extra harms and I would assume that the extra costs would be fairly minimal. Um, so they, they would probably argue rightly that the CPAP is worth the extra cost from, compared to the high flow nasal. Um, they haven't mentioned the other effects that the treatments have on the patients, such as uh, CPAP HUD is um, a little bit more invasive than high flow nasal, as in the patients will then be non-communicative, they won't be able to eat, drink, um, very difficult to take oral medications as well. And they have only measured this up to the one hour mark. I think they've justified that in saying that they're looking at rapid treatment and breaking the sort of cycle of uh, increased exertion, oxygen exertion demands. Um, but again, it would have been really nice to have these followed up in further um, beyond the one hour mark to see what the difference, if there is a difference at one hour, does that continue on to two hours, three hours, six hours? Because if we get to six hours and there's equivalence between the two treatments, then I think the argument for saying that this is a lot more cost effective would be greatly diminished. And the only follow-up that I could see was that mortality at 28 days was broadly equal between the two arms as well. Again, there was no further data given in that. Section D is, will the results help locally? Um, so this study was performed, and they've noted this in well in their limitations. Uh, this study was performed within one hospital, um, which was based in Malaysia. Um, it had a broadly Malay and Chinese ethnic background as well. So we need to know a lot more information before thinking that this is applicable to our um, general population here in Doncaster, such as um, is there a difference in the presentation between the two populations? Um, is there any other confounding factors such as um, underlying lung disease or varying causes of um, cardiopulmonary edema um, that would happen between the two populations? So I wouldn't say that we'd immediately think that it is applicable in our local population without any further information on the differences in populations or without this being replicated in a more similar population to our own in Doncaster. Um, are there any outcomes? Da, 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 da. Would the exper experimental intervention provide great value to the people in your care? Um, I suppose if you know, patients who are going on to need some form of high flow oxygen therapy. Um, we would be able to have discussions with them about whether that would be in a hood CPAP um, matter and or whether it would be high flow nasal. And this would point you towards uh, probably recommending a CPAP hood more than you would a high flow nasal if your goal is to improve the patient's parameters in a short um, period of time within that one hour time frame. Um, and are you able to disinvest resources in one or more existing interventions in order to be able to reinvest in the new intervention? So I think this would be whether in the hospital you would still need to stock both high, high flow nasal cannula and CPAP hoods because both are used in varying circumstances outside of acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, so I don't think you'd suddenly cancel all your subscriptions for getting high flow nasal cannula pieces because you would use them in other circumstances. So I don't think that we would necessarily disinvest um, from high flow nasal into CPAP hoods without it also being something that is demonstrated across the, all, the whole range of deliverance of high flow nasal uh, to patients as well. Um, and just to summarize what my thoughts were on the paper in general, um, I mean, we can demonstrate it at both 
interventions clearly, just coming back to the graphic size, clearly have good, um, good treatment for um, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. They both improve vastly on the um, measures um, that they've, the outcomes for the primary and secondary outcomes compared to the standard therapy, which is just high flow oxygen. Um, there is maybe a slight balance in saying that CPAP hood would be the first part of call if that can be tolerated by patients. Um, but I think overall, I would like to know what happens beyond that first hour and you know what the outcomes are much further down the line. And also to know whether this information is applicable to our general population as well here in Doncaster. Thank you, Patrick. That was extremely thorough. You really engaged with the paper. I've got a question for you. Mm -hmm. I know you really didn't like the variety in the extra medications and the way that the patients were treated outside of the, the study protocol. So they rather blandly say in the text that in, in addition to the study intervention, patients received a standard treatment based on their clinical profile in accordance with acute heart failure guidelines mm -hmm. at cover all of that wonderful variety, or do you suspect that they were just, it was a bit of a free for all? I think, I think it is a fairly big discrepancy. Um, I mean, it could all just be random chance and that's what they've demonstrated that it could be random chance. Obviously we've not had access through to the protocol, um, but even if the patients are getting different treatments as the protocol, there must be a clinical difference between the patients. Um, and I think, if you're saying that the, you know, one out of nine patients is getting a different treatment to all the rest, um, that really I think has to be accounted for when you're when you're thinking about the results. So even if it was, it's it, they've not, it's not um, something that they've done wrong, and they've not tried to influence the outcome of the trial by saying, oh, let's give all the CPAP patients extra fruzamide. But they've said, oh, these patients will require fruzamide as well. Um, and by all means, they've, they've done it as per the protocol would state. But I think when you're coming to it and looking at the results, that is one, I think, big flaw when you're trying to justify that CPAP is better when these patients have got CPAP, but a great portion of them also got a little bit more medical treatment than the rest of them. I'm really delighted that you've gone into that amount of detail because superficially, with that lovely graphic up front, it, it looks like an um, open and shut case, doesn't it? Mm. And if you don't dig a little deeper and consider, then you could easily come to the wrong conclusion. I'm really, really pleased that you've gone to that um, depth. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to say on this one? That was really nice, Patrick. Uh, very well presented. Just a, a small suggestion uh, like, when you're presenting this kind of appraisal, it would be better if you use that list and whatever you're saying, if you put your comments in that list and if you highlight in that article, because all of us, even though we have gone beforehand, we want to know your point of view. So if you highlight that, that really helps actually. Yeah, so this is my first time here, so I've got the list. Of yeah, I know, that. but uh, when you're presenting, like for the all the attendees, I mean, when if you mark the whole presentation, even we can't see it properly. Like, so if you just highlight those points and enlarge it, that gives us a clear idea that what exactly your point of view you want to present and what are the outcomes you're thinking, like for, as per the list, what is your thought about that? So that, you know, that gives us a brief idea. Okay, this is what the article was intended for. And this is how you have appraised it. I mean, as a suggestion, I would I would suggest. That. Having seen the other present presentations do that in a similar way, I think that would be something that would um, would change. And I think I would do that PowerPoint method with. But otherwise, it was really very informative, very nice. I mean, all of you who ever have presented, I observed from morning. It was very nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was um, a very thorough thorough dig into this uh, paper, Patrick. But like you pointed out. I think the outcome, it looks like there was a bit of a bias and decide what primary outcome they chose. Mm -hmm. I think I would say the paper skewed towards HCPAP as a um, rather than the uh, high flow nasal cannula, cannula as a means of uh, oxygen therapy in this case. 
like uh, Sarah said, it would have been nice if we knew what they started with, which, uh, what they decided their primary outcomes would be before the intervention itself. So maybe it would have been nice to know if they actually changed their, their decision as they went along with the with the um, with the interview uh, with the with the study, but like yeah, I mean it's a good thing for us to learn from, and it's a good thing to, for us to learn how how and the, the other thing is we don't I don't know if we have any um, interest if the public uh, the researchers have any interest in the CPAP. <laughs> could that have been, could that have influenced their decision? I don't know if they declared their their uh, interest or they working um, mainly as okay. Let's see. Of compliance of JD. That wasn't, I don't think there's anything in there that would make them much more biased towards CPAP. Yeah. They received a fee for a lecture by GE Healthcare outside this work. Maybe. Yeah, what know. is that for? GE Healthcare. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it was a. I mean, it's a good, it's a very good dissection of the paper, and for you to 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 um, to to pin out those points, it's, it's a good way to, you know, dissect the paper, and it's a good way to learn about biases and as outcome. People say you can always do a paper to prove any point, and you know, this <laughs> because I will have used my outcomes. I will have taught you know the the ratio of the uh, PC, PO2 stroke the FiO2 would have been a more scientific. Um, primary outcome, because that tells us the amount of oxygen that the patient is receiving. I mean, that is diffusing through the alveolus, or alveoli. I think that would have been a better primary outcome rather than respiratory rate, which is very, very, you know, you can be anxious and be tachycardic, or you can just increase your respiratory rate. It's, I, so, and yeah, you did pick up that, but I'm just wondering why the, why the, why the uh, investigators decided to do that, yeah. Can you, can you eat and drink with the nasal cannula? Yes. So yes. nasal it's just like a little thing that goes under the nose and puts 70 litres of oxygen up the nose. Whereas a CPAP HUD, I know this paper definitely brought me back in flashbacks to uh, COVID ITU. Um, I've seen all those patients lined up in CPAP HUDs. But it's a lot more distressing than nasal cannula, um, as in it gets very steamy, it gets very hot. Um, the patients can't talk to people. Um, they can eat and drink, but again, that, you need to open the window and let out all the treatment for a little bit. Um, so again, that is probably something that would also, when you're deciding between the two values, is something that you would take into mind that's not mentioned here in the paper. But the nasal cannula, can, can it um, recruit more alveoli? Yes, yeah, so it, it, it does Sorry. provide peep, but it's not a fixed amount of peep and mm -hmm. it does vary between people. So if you've got a nasal cannula on and your mouth closed, you might be getting maybe five to ten of peep. But if you open your mouth, that, peep is suddenly going to drop all away mm. so it's like it's, it's there is peep but you just can't quantify it whereas with the CPAP HUD um, that is a, a fixed valve and it will give you a defined amount of peep if there is no leaks in the system yeah yeah, yeah. so I, th I think I think it's very important it is to to define the conditions so what set of intervention it will be needed uh, for instance if there is a proper uh, acute respiratory syndrome probably nasal cannula might not be as effective as uh, oxygen under pressure. No, and again, yeah, in, certainly tr in trust I've worked out that certainly CPAP would be your first line to go and then high flow nasal may be something that you use sort of on the wean down of the other side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right, yeah. So it's probably not uniformly practicable for the population of patient we see, is it? No, but we do, I mean, especially in more recent time, and we have been starting patients on CPAP within the department in Rhesus or in yellow, when we used to have a yellow area as well. Um, certainly that was a much more an ARDS picture, but obviously um, this is a complementary side point to this to saying, you know, are we, what we're we doing in practice with the other side of things, which is the acute pulmonary edema as well. Excellent. Just to satisfy my curiosity, I've had a look at the um, registration of the trial protocol and they did set out right from the beginning to look at the respiratory rate. So they didn't cherry pick uh, yeah. outcomes, which might put your mind at rest slightly. Good, good. There we are. I, okay. think, the, I think the general club proving uh, very, very popular, very good. Excellent. <laughs> well, it's really, it's really, you know, we, we are really oh. getting, uh, you know, 
I, I think we should be thankful to Sarah because of her initiative. Of Actually, now people have started developing that appraisal skills. We are taking we are taking it seriously now. <laughs> Of course, of course. I'm, I'm really enjoying the way this is developing. I mean, it, it won't be that long and you can pick whatever trials or whatever study types you like and you'll be doing something that is interesting to you. At the moment, I'm choosing the papers to bring out different teaching points more than what's, you know, clinically relevant. So, uh, I mean, I mean, but I think we're not far off. Traditionally, General Club used to be getting some BMG or something or uh, emergency, uh, you know, and reading the paper and, you know, uh, then start discussion. But this is a very technical stuff, you know, which we are learning from here. I, I yeah, think it's been terrific. The attention to detail and the, the engagement with the papers is really lovely to see. Um, so thank you for all our presenters this morning for that. Excellent. I've got a couple of different things I wanted to show you. If I can steal five minutes, it's like a little hangover from last week where I was showing you some electronic resources. Can I, can I be cheeky? Yeah. Take five minutes. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I will need to share my screen in a sec. So um, Patrick, would you mind? Oh, that's fantastic. Now I have a small apology to make for last week. Um, I was presenting to you on e-resources with a migraine and I was not at my sharpest or finest. And I think I forgot to do several things, uh, including get myself locked out of Dynamed. Um, I've got, I'm trying to make it up to you today. There's a fantastic brand new resource that we've got for accessing full text articles. Now it was ready to show you last week and we haven't got it on our website yet even, but I'm gonna stick it into WhatsApp in a second. Um, and the other thing which has just reminded me is do you all know that you can get WhatsApp on the web so that you can get your WhatsApp up on your laptops? Because uh, this is a relatively recent discovery for me and by goodness, it makes it easier for me to add documents to your WhatsApp. So bear with me a second, I'm gonna show you and we're gonna use that BMJ paper that has already been presented this morning. I'm gonna have a look at the early, um, the BMJ paper, the early computed tomography, coronary and geography because the protocol and some supplementary material was available online. I've just sent you the PDF of the um, of the article, but you could, if I show you, go and easily get to the full text. So bear with me a second. I will show you what I'm up to. I'll do my whole screen. Okay, so it's just um, the trial registry for the what we were talking about before. Um, this new resource I want to show you. It's called LibKey. It's something that has been purchased nationally for us. And what you all you need to do is to put the document, the object identifier number, the DOI from an article into this particular, um, let me just start beginning. I haven't got a migraine today, but it's still clearly not going that well. Right, so LibKey, which I will send you the link for, is an like an interface between what we have access to and um, sending automatic requests. So I've also got, with a bit of luck, the paper here. I'm gonna steal the DOI, which is a direct object identifier. Each article that's published has one of these. Um, I'm just gonna steal that little bit of it and I'm gonna pop it in Libkey's friendly box here. So this is the direct object identifier for a particular article and it has a look. And if we have access, it will find it. So you do need Athens to visit the full text, but it's giving you all of the options that you have. So we can download the PDF, which is easy, but I want to visit it online because I think that's where all of the extra material is. So it's looking, it's locating. It ought to bring us to the full text of the article and you're able to access all of the supplementary stuff once you're online. So the PDF I put on WhatsApp isn't the whole story. And a couple of these different papers have said the trial protocol is in the supplementary material or we're not always able to get there. Sometimes we can. And LibKey is this, it's absolutely brilliant and it's really easy to use. And I'm going to um, click go there. So you've got this little link for all of your full text queries. If you come to um, any paper, you can put the DOI into LibKey and it will either take you straight to the full text 
or it pre-populates a request form with the details of the article. You just need to put your details on the form and it'll, you go submit and it gets emailed to DRI library and then they find the full text for you. It's absolutely seamless. It's fantastic. And it's just arrived. So you are some of the very first people to find out about our shiny new wow. thing. We will have it on our website presently. It's being added almost as we speak. Um, so you're getting a really easy, quick way to get to full text. So I will just stop sharing now. And I can get back to Zoom, which is all going a bit hideous. Stop share. There we go. So that's the little bit that would have been ideal to show you last week, but it wasn't quite ready and it wasn't quite on the ball. So um, I think that's it. I've stolen five minutes, but um, I think you'll forgive me. Okay. Thank you, everyone, every participant, and thank you, especially to Sarah. So initially, I feel a bit difficult to present like critical appraisal, but but the Sarah helped a lot to give a like a standard tool. So to my all colleagues, if you feel like difficult, if you go through the like uh, tools, it is like mathematics. If you see question one, go to paper and find the like paper things and bring that one. So uh, initially, I feel a bit difficult for my first uh, like critical appraisal, but this is my second one. So I feel more confident and I feel more easy to use these tools. So um, thank you, Shara, very much. Excellent. No problem. And if you are getting a difficulty, contact me. I will help you get past whatever little difficulty you're having I possibly can. There's, um, there's always something to watch, a video I can find. Siraj mentioned uh, a video he'd watched that really helped him assess the, the systematic review. There's loads of resources out there. So let me help you. Thank you. So, so to say goodbye, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks you all. Guys.